Hi, this is Mike Russos from the .NET customer success team. I'm going to talk about dependency injection in ASP.NET Core. For those who aren't familiar with the concept of dependency injection, it's a design pattern where a component's dependencies are uh, loosely coupled to it so that they can be easily swapped out for different dependencies or uh, different dependencies can be provided in different environments and you don't have um, tight coupling between different components. So as an example, in an ASP.NET Core controller, like this customer's controller, rather than having a specific implementation of iCustomer's data provider, which is our repository API, which we depend on here, uh, instead of that, we have an argument in the customer's controller constructor and ASP.NET Core will provide the registered instance of this type at runtime. So the developer can, when they're registering their services, easily in one place change, say, instead of having one implementation of iCustomer's data provider, maybe they want to provide a different one. Or in some environments they would like one, and in another environment they would like a, a different one. And in any place where this type is uh, required, will inject whatever the developer has registered rather than having um, hard dependencies in lots of different components, potentially. So the way that you register services, um, there's actually a lot of ways to register them, which is nice because it gives you some flexibility. The, the most common pattern will be to register all of your services in the Configure Services API. This is sort of the uh, standard way of doing this in ASP.NET Core because inside of startup.configure services, uh, ASP.NET Core expects to be able to call this method and have its uh, dependency injection container set up. So if we wanted to add an implementation of that type we were, of that interface we were just looking at, you could do that here by calling services and dot add scoped or add lifetime or add transient, and I'll explain those differences in a minute. And that's kind of the default way of, of doing this. There's other options too, though. When you're creating your, your web host with a web host builder, before the ASP.NET Core app's web host has even been created, you can call dot configure services on the builder and specify uh, any dependencies that you'd like to inject at that point. And this is an easy way to, de to inject um, dependencies which might be coming from outside of the ASP.NET Core app itself and coming from whatever process is hosting it. So as an example, if you have a service fabric application, which is hosting an ASP.NET Core app as a stateless service, this would be a way that you could inject the service context and make that available to the ASP.NET Core app, even though the ASP.NET Core app uh, typically would be running without any knowledge of the service fabric application that it's running inside of. So that's another option. The other thing you can do is you can use a uh, non-default container. So you can create a a container from a different dependency injection technology like Autofac and then use that container as your ASP.NET Core dependency injection container. So in this project, for example, I've added a Autofac dependency and a dependency on the Autofac extensions dependency injection package, which is where we have extension methods to um, plug the Autofac container into ASP.NET Core. So then in configure services, Instead of returning void, like we would normally do from configure services, we return an iService provider, which is going to be a type that, uh, that gives access to the container we want to use. So we have a, an Autofac container we've created with their container builder. And this container builder could have been set up previously. It doesn't have to be set up in configure services. But you can call things like register type to register you know, an iCustomer's data provider here in the autofac container and then you call builder.populate and you pass in the iService collection and that populates the autofac container with the many ASP.NET Core services which are already in the iService collection. Uh, you, you build the autofac container and then you return an autofac service provider wrapping that container and now ASP.NET Core will use this container for dependency injection and Typically, you wouldn't even need to store this container anywhere, but I've actually stored it in a, a field here so that you could imagine if there were other, um, P, other components of your process outside of ASP.NET Core app itself which needed access to its uh, dependency injection container, you could share this container uh, 
and it would it would be usable other places. Now, one challenge here is that autofat containers, um, it's a best practice not to change them, even even though you can. So you can call the dot .update method to change them, but it's it's recommended you don't do that. And uh, ASP.NET Core containers are actually immutable. So since you don't want to be changing containers after they've been created, you need to wait to create the autofat container until you've populated it with your ASP.NET Core services. If that's really difficult because you need access to this container before the ASP.NET Core app has started up, one way you could go about this would be using something like uh, AS, uh, Autofact modules so that you register the same services in an Autofact container that's being constructed in the ASP.NET Core app and in an Autofact container which is constructed outside of the app. So then you'll have two separate containers, but they'll have the same services registered in them except that this one inside the ASP.NET Core application will also have all of the ASP.NET Core specific services, which the external container won't have. Anyhow, those are some different ways that you could register services for an ASP.NET Core app to use. To, to use those services then, I've already showed you the primary way of doing that, which is through constructor uh, argument injection. So in a controller, in ASP.NET Core middleware, uh, anywhere like that, you can specify these arguments that need to be provided in your constructor, and the ASP.NET Core runtime will provide them from its dependency injection system. It will provide the entire graph that's needed, so let's suppose that our implementation of iCustomer's data provider itself needed something injected in its constructor. Well, then ASP.NET Core would, would also find that for us. It would resolve that from the, the service container as well, so that you get the whole graph of objects that you need. Um, you then store these somewhere and you're able to use them at runtime. Another way that you can go about this would be using the um, from services uh, attribute on a, a parameter in some method. So when someone calls post async, we expect to be getting some data transfer object out of the body of the post. We can also say that we're going to need access to a resource manager, and that's going to be pulled from our service container. So this will be provided by dependency injection, not from the web request coming into the controller. So that's another way that you could do this. Finally, in your HTTP context, you're going to have this request services uh, property, which is the service provider. So you can resolve things at runtime if for some reason you you know, weren't able to do it through the constructor because you weren't sure which types you were going to need yet, you can resolve them at runtime calling request services.get service from the HTTP context. Um, the recommended way, again, is just to, to use the constructor, but this sample demonstrates, you know, a couple of other ways that you can, that you can do that if, if need be. Um, now, we had talked previously a little bit about the lifetime, so I briefly want to cover the idea of lifetimes in ASP.NET Core dependency injection. When you're registering, um, when you're registering a service, you'll notice that the add APIs on your service collection include things like add singleton, add scoped, add transient. What those mean are that's when the service type will be created. If you say add singleton, then we're going to either create one single instance of this of this type and return it for every request for that service. Or you could actually create the instance yourself as we're doing here and pass it in. And now this will be the instance that's always returned. We will never new up another um, instance of that particular type. Um, so that can be useful if there's some API that maybe has state that needs to be persisted or that is expensive to spin up, you can just have a single instance that's returned. Uh, now your default is going to be add scoped. Add scoped means that for every HTTP request that the ASP.NET Core app processes, it will create a new instance of that service and then it will dispose of it as needed when the web request finishes. So this is um, kind of the default because you don't have a lot of long-lived objects that you don't necessarily need, but it also strikes the balance of at least keeping things alive throughout the web request. So you'll see that one used. Uh, and then add transient is, is as you might expect, uh, 
a lifetime where the service will be recreated every time it's requested. So every time we uh, a controller requires a particular dependency or every time that a method requires it, the um, ASP.NET Core will new up uh, a new instance of that of that object. So and this this matters too because if you have multi if you've registered multiple different dependency types and some of them depend on others, you want to be cognizant of what lifetimes they're using so that you don't end up with something with a a singleton scope depending on something with a uh, or a singleton lifetime depending on something with a scope lifetime because then you could end up with things you know with state being reset unexpectedly underneath so like as an example we call services.addb context here which is a helper method for uh, registering an entity framework context with dependency injection and this registers it with a scope lifetime so then later when I'm constructing my autofat container and I'm registering uh, an I customer's data provider saying, oh, use this thing which I already registered as a DB context because it implements both. I'm, I'm being careful to say dot instance per lifetime scope because that's the autofac equivalent of the scope lifetime. And I don't want this thing to end up being a singleton, although that's not the default of autofac, but I don't want it to be a singleton when it's depending on something that's going to be recreated with every web request. So uh, again, this is kind of a brief overview. There, um, to, to see more, there's, there's pretty good documentation out at um, docs.microsoft.com. Go to the ASP.NET documentation and look for under Fundamentals Dependency Injection. And you can read up about a lot of the stuff I've been talking about here. If you're going to end up um, using something like Autofac, they have their own um, uh, documentation as well, which you can go look at, which covers uh, using Autofac in ASP.NET Core. Um, and also, I suppose, a, a useful resource is the, the sample app that I was looking at is one that the .NET customer success team is, is just starting to put together to demonstrate some of these things we're talking about. And that's available up on GitHub. Let's see if I can find that repository real quick. It's under JJ Vertical Demos. So you can come take a look at that as well.